Hey, Miss Potts. If you find this recording, don't feel bad about this. Part of the journey is the end. Just for the record, being adrift in space with zero promise of rescue is more fun than it sounds. Food and water ran out four days ago. Oxygen will run out tomorrow morning. That'll be it. When I drift off, I will dream about you. It's always you. did exactly what he said he was going to do. He wiped out 50% of all living creatures. We lost, all of us. We lost friends, we lost family. We lost a part of ourselves. This is the fight of our lives. This is gonna work, Steve. I know it is. Because I don't know what I'm gonna do if it doesn't. We met a few years ago at the airport in Germany. Got got really big. Is this an old message? Ant Man, Ant Man. I know you know. I know you know that. That's the front door. That's me. Can you buzz me in? Well, good morning, that church. How are you? The Avengers. You know, Thanos wiped out fifty percent of the population. I've seen fifty percent of the movies, so I feel like we're. So it's pretty good, though. I'm going to watch the rest of it. We were watching, we were watching it last night, matter of fact. We'll watch the rest. Some of you wonder, how do you put together a message? Man? Well, because I got the theme off the first part of it. So, you know, one of the things that stood out to me in the very beginning of the Avengers movie that I thought was something that was so relevant was the sense of overwhelming pain and how pain changes people. And I don't know if you noticed how you had these incredibly powerful characters that at one point in this, you know, timeline, in this saga, they were... They were, they were confident and they were, they were pressing forward and then they met something so formidable that they were finally just completely overwhelmed. And that's really how Endgame opens up is this, this group of people who are just completely overwhelmed. And, you know, I thought that was just exactly what we need to talk about because the truth is I don't care how spiritual that you might be. I don't care how strong you might be. You, maybe you're a strong personality, you come from a strong family or whatever. All of us face points in our life where we're completely overwhelmed. We're, we can be overwhelmed by our marriages. We can be overwhelmed by parenting. We can be overwhelmed by our health. We can even be overwhelmed by discouragement. You know, the hot water heater went out, the car broke, the dog's sick, you got that neighbor, you know, and then you married that person. I mean, all that stuff just sort of comes, comes together and, and sort of overwhelms us, and we, we experience that. But, you know, the question is, is that when we're overwhelmed, why is it so dangerous? What's the big deal about being overwhelmed? And I think it's this, is we become vulnerable. I know when I'm overwhelmed, I'm much more vulnerable to sin that I wouldn't be vulnerable to otherwise. I'm vulnerable to, to do rash things. I'm vulnerable to make spontaneous decisions that won't turn out well. I'm, I'm vulnerable to crazy decisions or depression or anxiety. When we're overwhelmed, it puts us in a place where we do some, some ridiculous things. I think, I think being overwhelmed is a lot like being drunk. You just can't be trusted in your decision making, and you have to think about that. You know, we don't let you drive a car when you're drunk because you're not making good decisions. Well, I think there's a lot of truth in this also that when you're overwhelmed, you probably shouldn't be making some big decisions. I mean, I can't count how many times that I've worked with people or I myself have experienced making a crazy decision because the truth was I was under this crazy amount of pressure and it just seemed like a, a way to stop it or overcome it, but it was a bad decision. Oh, being overwhelmed is a, is a tough thing. Now, here's what's crazy is that when we look at being overwhelmed, we have to think about it like this. Tests sometimes overwhelm us. Trials, difficulties, problems, hardships, they overwhelm us. But what if I were to tell you that oftentimes in our life, especially as a follower of Jesus, 
you and I can be overwhelmed actually by the work that God's doing in your own life. There are times where God, his activity in our life, moving things around, changing things, molding us in the image of his son, there are times when that activity is absolutely overwhelming. And you know what? God didn't ignore that reality. And we're going to study today, together today in a, in a passage where Jesus teaches us the reality of God working in our life and how it can be overwhelming. How do, how do we know that Jesus knew that this activity could be overwhelming to us? Well, if you read in John chapter 16, which is the verse after this John 15 teaching, here's what he said. He said, I've told you these things so that you won't abandon your faith. That's a pretty big deal. Jesus is saying, you know what? I gave you this information. I'm, I gave you this to download and understand. Why did I do that? Because I don't want you to leave your faith behind. You can be so overwhelmed by the proactivity of God in our life as he's, as he's moving and changing and pruning and, and doing all these things. We can be so overwhelmed by that. Jesus said there's a danger of you just wanting to walk away from it all and just throw your hands up and say, I'm done with this. So he said, I'm, I'm giving you some, a way to, to cope with this moment of pressure. I'm giving you a way to deal with the pressures when, when you're going through testing and trials and when God is pruning at the same time. I'm going I'm to help you understand how to do that. And that's what you and I are going to focus on today. We're going to focus on how it is that we can overcome the things that, that overwhelm us. But you know, for us to understand God's work in our life, I think we need to understand God's end game. I mean, what, is it, what does God ultimately want? What's he wanting in you and wanting in me? Well, he's not silent about it. And this is not in your outline, but you ought to mark this down. Romans chapter 8 and verse 29. It's such a powerful verse that I want you to get it. Romans 8 and 29 says this, For God knew his people in advance. That means God already knew. That's the thing I love about God. God's never surprised. God never goes, wait, what? Never happens. It says he chose them to become like his son. What's God's end game? For us to be like Jesus. And you're going to see that there's some very defining marks about Jesus that makes him radically different than us. And I mean, beyond the miraculous movement of him raising the dead or healing the blind and all the things that he did, you're going to see some behaviors and you're going to see an attitude and you're going to see some focus in his life that you and I need. And you don't know how much you need it, uh, except for maybe where you're overwhelmed right now, you're, you're looking for some kind of help. Well, this is the help for us to look at and understand how do we become more like Christ how do we participate with God in the work that he's doing in our life? And let's just kind of dig in this together. So how do I overcome what is overwhelming me? The first thing, if you're filling in blanks, write this down. I have to understand the purpose of pruning. There's a purpose in pruning. Here's what God does. He says, that, you know what? I'm going to help everyone understand my relationship to you and how I'm working in your life. And so he took them and he says, let's go into this garden. Let me show this to you. See, everybody that Jesus is talking to, everybody had a garden then. Everybody understood. They, they knew the practices of a garden. We may not know those practices as well, but I think we know them well enough to understand what Jesus is about to teach us. And he takes us into this garden. He says, hey, let me show you some players in this garden, and let me show you how God's working in our life, and let me show you how this relationship works. Let me show you what's really important. Let me show you how to survive when you're overwhelmed. Let me show you how to thrive. Let me show you how to get through this. And that's what he's about to do. In John chapter 15, verse one, Jesus says this, I'm the true grapevine and my father's the gardener. And so the first two people that Jesus, you know, shines a light on first off is the vine. The vine is the main part of that, of that plant. It's the main part of it. It's, it's what feeds all the limbs. It's the part of the plant that determines what kind of fruit that it produces. It, it determines the DNA of the plant, if you will. It determines its identity. And Jesus said, you know what? The vine that we have to be grafted into, the vine that feeds us and nourishes us and supplies us with everything, it's me. That's what Jesus has just said. You, you're, you're not going to exist in this garden of life and be what God asks you to be and be able to get through it until you understand that I, I, I'm what you need. You need me. That's what Jesus is saying. Then he goes on and he says, there's someone else that's, that you need to know about. And that's the gardener. And the gardener, Jesus said, is my father, God the Father. That's who the gardener is. Now, the reason why Jesus defines the role of God as being the gardener is because the gardener's the one who determines what the garden does. It's up to the gardener. The garden is at the will of the gardener, okay? Especially if you're a good gardener. I'm not a good gardener, so this kind of off my plate, but here's what I understand. If you're a good gardener, you determine where the plants grow. You determine how they grow. You determine what fruit they produce. It's up to you because you're the gardener. 
And I think one of the main reasons why Jesus tells us that his father's the gardener is because the gardener does something in the garden which is kind of important, but it's not necessarily enjoyable to the plants. And that's he prunes. He brings out the shears and he cuts stuff off of the plant that doesn't need to be there. He trims the life up and he takes things out of the way that don't, he points out what's messed up and what's broken. That's something that he does. And so the gardener in this story is God. And the reason why Jesus points that out is because there's going to be times in your own life, in my life as well, that God's going to come in with the pruning shears and he's going to cut things off that we want to keep. And until you understand that it's God the Father doing it, you won't know whether you can trust whether that's being cut off for the right reasons or not. And if we're not careful, if we don't really know and understand that God is the gardener, what we're, what we're prone to do is when the limb hits the ground, we go, wait a second, I don't want to put that back on. And we get out our duct tape and our staple gun. Some of you ladies, your hot glue. You do, I, want, I, don't, I wasn't ready to let go of that yet, but God's like, you need to be rid of that. That's got to go. But, but, but he, he's the gardener. He's the one doing the pruning. And when it comes to the, the sort of the garden of life that God's given us here, what he's telling us is, is, that, is that God, when it comes to pruning, very often God is cutting off something I want to keep that God wants to replace with something he wants more. He's the gardener. He has every right to cut off what he does. He has every right to scramble my life's eggs. He has every right to change things up. He has every right to move things around. Some of you right now, you're overwhelmed because you're in the middle of transition. What if I were to tell you that, the, that in the midst of your transition, God, the gardener, is actively working, transplanting, moving, shifting, changing things in your life. As much as it feels and seems like to you that it's completely you know, chaotic and it makes no sense, Jesus wants you to know that the gardener is always in control of his garden. And it's okay. And maybe you as the plant don't fully understand that, but God does. And he's working and he's not finished. And this is not the end of the story. And if you'll submit to his will, it'll result in incredible fruit bearing in the next season. And we have to submit to that. He goes on in verse 2. Listen to this. And this is the key verse for this whole verse of scripture. Because I believe John 15 has been used to confirm some things that it never said. Listen to what he says. Verse 2, he says, he, cut off, he cuts off every branch of who? All right, let's look at that again. I'm going to read it real quick. It says, I'm the true great vine. My father's the gardener. He cuts off every branch of, of mine. Who's the mine? Who's speaking here? It's Jesus. So Jesus is speaking. And Jesus has just told us, before we get into this story, every branch that he's about to talk about, which incidentally, we'll know what the branches are in just a second. He's about, every branch he's about to talk about, Jesus belongs to me. These are all mine. That's important. Because what's going to happen in a little bit, we're going to look at two types of branches and you'll need to know this story. So I'll, I'll get to it. He goes on. He said, he cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. That means that even the branches that don't produce fruit still belong to Jesus. And I'll, I'll explain that to you in a second. And he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they'll produce even more. Verse 3. You have already been pr pruned and purified, listen, by the message that I've given you. In other words, Jesus said... That you've got, first of all, you've got the vine, that's Jesus. You've got the gardener, that's God the Father. Um, you, you've got the branches, which incidentally, the branches are, are not you. They're the life you live. That's going to be really important. When we're talking about the branches, the branches aren't talking about you as a person or the eternity that you're going to inherit. It's talking about, in fact, it's talking about the life that you have a chance to live. We're talking about whether you're productive or not, or whether your life is wasted or not. Because in a little bit, these branches that are not producing, that don't produce, we're going to talk a little more about it, but we've already read that they're cut off. Later, the Bible says they're thrown in a fire and they're burned up. That's demonstrating of a life that you could have lived, but you didn't live it, you wasted it. You wasted it on something else. You had a chance to live for God. You had a chance to live for your good and his glory, but you didn't do it. You focused your life and you used it for something else. Can I tell you something? There's a lot of temporary good lives that you can live that have no eternal value. And so what he's telling us is, is that there's some of us are going to choose to take this life that God has given us. And you only get one shot at this thing. You only get one run at it. And we take this life that God's given us and we use it for the wrong things. We squander it. And God said, that's these, that's these unproductive branches. This is not talking about you or your salvation. Because remember, Jesus started this story off by saying, all these branches of mine, they're all mine. 
A person that doesn't have a relationship with Jesus are not his. He only possesses and has ownership of those who know him and have trusted him as, his, as their personal savior. So it's important that when we read this, this is not saying, hey, you know what? If you don't live a certain way and you don't live the right kind of life, you're cut off from God and you're thrown in a fire and that's the end of it. That's not what this, this is saying at all. What this is saying is, is that you can know Jesus. You can know him as your personal savior. You can have full well knowledge and understanding that Jesus died on the ball side of a hill for you and you could have trusted him and put your life in his hands. Yet you can still live your life in a certain way and waste it. That's what he's talking about. And let me tell you, so often we put such an emphasis on getting to heaven and we don't put enough emphasis on bringing heaven to earth that we've made a mistake. And so what Jesus is telling us about here is he's saying, hey, it's a huge loss the way you live if you don't live it for God's glory and you're good. That's a huge loss. That's, that's exactly what he's saying. But he goes on, verse 3 says, you've already been pruned and purified by the message or the word, Jesus says. So Jesus says there's one other thing, and just write this in if you want to. What are the shears that God uses to prune our lives? Well, according to what Jesus just said, it's his word. That's his word. This is God's pruning shears right here, God's word. And, and by the way, if you have a relationship with Jesus and you know him as your savior, this is something you have to constantly be going back to. When our relationship is right with God, this book is so much more than just something we hang on to. It's so much more than something we just carry around. This book becomes the proof text for how we're supposed to live. This is God's word. And I know we live in an age where we have the Bible surrounding us so much and we're so saturated by it that I think we take it for granted. But Jesus says that God's word, that's the shears that God uses to cut the stuff out of our life that doesn't need to be there. When I'm studying God's word and I get into God's word and I'll be reading and God will point out an attitude in my own life that God's saying, hey, that's not the attitude you're supposed to have. And you know what I can do? I can either go, nah, no thanks. And I can ignore the work of the gardener using his shears to trim something off that needs to be gone. Or I can say, God, you're right. And I can submit to the shears and God will cut off something that needs to be cut off. In his word, God will reveal to me that, that maybe the anxiety and fear that, that's gripped me at this particular... That's not the kind of attitude I'm supposed to have when the Bible says I've not given you a spirit of fear and timidity. That's not been given to you by God. Then I have to let that go. Why? Because it didn't, if it wasn't given to me by God, it's not supposed to be held on to. It's dead wood. It's useless. And so when I'm getting near and I have God's shears going in my life and God is trimming the garden, what happens is I'm reading God's word. Then there's parts of my life that should be falling away. And incidentally, that's going to happen throughout your experience with Christ. This is the, this is the pruning shears, God's word. You know, I'm, I'm grateful that people come to that church and I'm so grateful that I get to be your pastor and I'm so grateful that I get to teach and I'm so grateful for all those things. But and I'm grateful you're here today, and I'm grateful that people come to listen. But I'm going to be completely honest with you. If this is the extent of your exposure to God's truth, you are missing out on so much. This is God's Word. You, you have no idea what God went through to make sure that you could have this in its purity and in its entirety so that you and I could look to it for, for guidance and direction for our life. And I just wonder what kind of people we would be if we just got used to and maybe focused on studying God's Word, reading God's Word, understanding God's Word. If we just made it a habit to put our lives in, in this position where we say, God, whatever you show me, I, I'm in, I'm willing. Just reveal it to me. And you just spend time in God's Word. You know, and I'm gonna, I'll say it, you know, I, I read from the New Living Translation. I use a lot of different translations of the Bible um, I like the NLT. It's easy to understand. I know some of you are going to get your britches in a bunch because you're married to a certain translation of the Bible, but God's not, okay? Um, if you can read it and understand it, you know what I've learned? You'll read it and you'll understand it, you know? And I'm going to say to you, you need that because if this is something that creates spiritual nourishment in my life, I need it often. You know, if, if, if every time I sat down to a meal, the meal was put in front of me and I didn't know how to break it apart, I didn't know how to eat it, I didn't know how to consume it, then it would do me no good. And, and you know what? Physically, I'd be malnourished. Well, the same thing's true about God's word when spiritually, this should be a meal that's in front of you. You know what? You need to learn and practice that this is, this is God speaking in my life. And when he does, you know what God does through his word? One of the things he does, he prunes things off. He cuts things out of our life. He brings to our attention when a relationship's out of balance and it's out of character and it shouldn't be there. God goes, hey, this shouldn't be like this. And you know what? When you study God's word, he's cutting things off. 
He's putting you in a place where you can trim away, saying, hey, let's get rid of that. Let's get rid of that attitude. Maybe that sinful behavior, maybe that thought process that you're clinging to, God said, hey, no, let's get rid of that. This is the pruning shears that God uses. So the branch is the life that we're to live, but there's two kinds of branches that this verse speaks of. There's unproductive branches. That's a wasted life. God says some of us will know him as Savior, but we won't submit to him and we won't live for him. That's what he says. And you can do that. Did you know that you can know Jesus and know him as your Savior and not live for Jesus and not inherit the benefits of knowing Jesus and not enjoy the goodness of God's presence? You can do that, y'all. You can do that. There are plenty of people who know Christ as their personal Savior, but they don't know the presence of Jesus practiced on a consistent basis. They don't know it and what we miss out on. And, and that's exactly what he's talking about, these unproductive branches. Now, there's another kind of branch. It's the productive branch. That's the branches that are shucking the corn, you know. They're doing a good job. And, you know, for me, if that's me, I'd say the productive branches, you get a ribbon or a trophy or something cool. But that's not what the Bible says. You know what the Bible says that, that the productive branches get? More pruning. <laughs> what? That seems kind of unfair, doesn't it? You know, something gets lobbed off. I don't feel good about that. But that's what God says. You want to know why? Because God's constantly and progressively moving you towards that goal of his to make you more and more like Jesus. And by the way, that never stops. I would love to say, y'all, I've gone through all the printing that I need. I've, I've arrived. You know, I'm a pastor, you know, which means super spiritual. Um, get a discount at the Christian bookstore. I mean, and I'd love to say, man, I got it, dude. I got it. But I'm going to tell you along the way, I'm, this is true. This is raw, okay? Along the way, I'll, go, I'll, I'll let an attitude, it'll just show up in my life. And I'll hang on to that attitude for a little bit. And God's like, hey, mm -mm. what are you doing? And I'm like, well, you know, hey, I deserve this attitude because what's happened over here. And God's like, nah, we're not going to do that. We're going to get rid of that. Lay that down. Surrender that. God's constantly doing that to all of us, y'all. Constantly. No one's ever arrived. And you know what? Sometimes I think we feel inferior because we look at our life and we go, man, so-and-so over here must be super sure. No, they just hide it better than you do. <laughs> The truth is, all of us are constantly learning every single day how to lean into the Savior more, how to depend on Jesus more, how, how, to, how to grow in Him more. And it's, it's, we have to go back to it over and over and over. And if we're productive, guess what's going to happen? We're going to get pruned. That's part of it. God's cutting things off that don't need to be there. Now, the question might come up is, well, why does God want to prune that stuff out? The reason is, is that if we're going to follow Jesus, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 7 that that's a real narrow pathway. In other words, you can't carry all the junk with you and go through there. We want to do that, though, don't we? We want to carry everything with us. I want to bring this broken relationship, this bad attitude, these other unhealthy pursuits, this unholy ideas. I want, to, I want to bring all that with me, and I just want to kind of all mesh together, and I'm just a Christian, but I cuss a little. And, I, and we just want, to, just want to carry the junk. But the truth is, is, is Jesus said that that pathway that he's called you and I to walk on, and he's called all of us, by the way, to walk on, is narrow. And you don't, you don't have the room to walk down that pathway. I'd, I'd go a step further. I'll say this. You won't see the pathway when, you're, when you're, your vision is so eclipsed by all these other things that you're selling your life out to that you don't need to. You won't even see it. You won't even see what God's inviting you to. So you know what God does? God starts trimming away. He's cutting the bangs off. He's getting stuff out of your vision where you can see what he's asked you to be and do because it's, it's worth so much more. And so we need to understand the purpose of printing. But the other thing, if we're going to overcome what overwhelms us, is we have to remember the rewards of remaining. There's a reward to sticking with it. And there's times you're going to want to quit. That's what Jesus said. In fact, let me show you the focus of this verse. And we're going to do it interactively. We're going to have fun, okay? About to have a good time right here. I'm going to read this, the next few verses. And every time I get to the word remain, you're going to say remain. Now, here's the thing. If you don't participate and nobody does it, it's going to be real awkward for y'all because I'm going to make fun of you and I'm going to step back and go, look, see, y'all are all not going to make heaven. Um, but, but, but I want you to say it. And the reason why I do is I think there's something powerful about when God's word comes out of our mouth. And I think there's something powerful when we come to the realization of something together. So, so we're going to look at this. John 15, verse 4, first word, Amen. in me and I will... In you, for a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you in me. Yes, I am the vine. You are the branches. Those who in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not 
in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile and burned. Again, that's not you as a person. That's the works of your life. In other words, your life made no difference. That's what he's saying. This is not about you being separated from God and cast into hell. That's not what this verse is about at all. Remember, these branches belong to Jesus. But it is saying this. There's great loss. When you sell out to other things and you don't sell out to the right things, then your life is wasted. And whatever else that you had an opportunity to do, it's not going to be accomplished. And that's too bad. And that's a great loss. Verse 7. But if you in me and my words in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. Now, here's what's funny. Is that we, because we read the Bible in certain ways. We're Americans. Americans, we want to be productive. We want to be successful. We want to have accomplishment. We want to get her done. We want to have this something to show for our effort. That's who we are. And, and, and Americans, when we read this teaching, what we'll do is we'll say, well, this is about fruit bearing. It's about being productive. That's not what this is about. You and I just define what this is about. What is Jesus teaching us? Is he teaching us about fruit bearing or what? About remaining, right? It's constantly remain, 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 remain. Here's the deal. Why does Jesus even mention fruit in this passage? It's because it's a gauge, not a goal. Let me give you an example. Just a few weeks ago, my daughter calls me on the phone in the middle of the night. She says, hey, Dad, my check engine light's on and the motor's making this bumpity bump sound to it. Oh, that's exciting. Um, have you checked oil? What's that? <laughs> so, so it's your sister. It's not you. So stop feeling convicted. Shh. So that's not what I said right there in the middle of church. And I said, um, she says, no, how do I, how do I do that? I said, well, there's this little, little yellow thing in there and you pull it out. Well, yeah, is it got showing anything? No, nothing's on it. That's the problem. Okay. Supposed to have something on it, this little slick stuff that makes it not go bang around or whatever. So she had a, a leak. It was, it was shooting out. Some seal was bad or something. So she puts oil in it. Anyway, gets home. Here's the reality, though. At, at a certain point, a light come on in her dash, and it said there's something wrong. Now, that light is not the goal. It's a gauge. The, the goal isn't to get the light turned off. The goal is to fix what's broken. See, in this passage, Jesus isn't saying, hey, I want you guys to figure out how to become productive. I want you to really be productive because that's the most important thing. No, no. He's not saying that's the subject for you. The subject for you, your action steps, your key deliverables is to remain in him. And if we don't get anything out of life, this one thing would be the greatest lesson we could learn is that we need Jesus, not just as Savior to keep us out of hell, but every day. And when you, you can know that, that your relationship to Jesus is fragmented or maybe it's not where it should be. You know how you know that? You know what the gauge is? Fruit. Let me give you some fruit to think about. Then we have the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So let's just start with love. You find an absence of love. You're, you're, you're feeling really good about yourself getting other people told and you're getting somebody else's goat and you don't mind hating on somebody. They don't believe like you believe. They don't look like you look. They don't have the same political affiliation. You feel completely justified to dislike them and hate them. Listen to me, that's ungodly and it is certainly against God's word. That's not for you. The world acts like that. But for those of us who've been transformed by the unmerited favor of God, can't look at somebody else and look down on them even as screwed up as their ideas might be. We have no right to not love. And when love is absent in your life, guess what it's telling you? Something's wrong. Joy. How about joy? Joy's not a pursuit. We don't chase after joy. We don't try to attain joy. We don't try to gather joy in for ourselves. Joy is the byproduct of remaining in Christ. But when joy's absent in your life and you're going, man, I'm just, I'm so sad. Then maybe what's going on is that gauge, that light on your life's dash is popping up and saying there's something wrong somewhere else. And here's what's wrong. You're not remaining in Jesus. See, Jesus didn't give us these marching orders. If you'll notice, he doesn't define what the fruit is. Did you notice that? The reason why the fruit's not defined is because that's not for you. The gardener determines the fruit. We just determine what we're going to remain in and what we're going to cling to and what we're going to hang on to. And I'm going to say this. For, for, for many of us that are in a, in a context or a moment of being overwhelmed, whether that's a career decision or that's a family problem or whatever it is, what you need is Jesus. And I don't know the last time that you took God's word and you pulled it out and you turned to those pages where the red words are dominant and you spent some time just sitting in front of the Lord and say, Lord, I just, I just need to hear from you. 
I don't know when the last time was you got alone and you just got quiet and you got on your face and you said, God, I know I hadn't talked to you in a while. And incidentally, some of us, we're, we're kind of afraid to do that because we're afraid God's mad, kind of like a bitter in-law that you hadn't visited in a long time or something. But the Bible tells me that God doesn't do that. The Bible teaches us when you look at the story of the prodigal son, this kid that went off and lived like a fool, when he came back home, the Bible says that God ran to him. In fact, the, the Bible says this, God says this about himself, if you'll draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. So that means that, that God doesn't come to you as this frustrated, sort of scorned heavenly father. No, he comes to you saying, it is so good to be close to you again. And I don't know when the last time you got along with God and you got on your face. And I, I guarantee you there's a ton of people in this room that got problems that nobody else knows about. They have worries and fears that maybe nobody knows about. And maybe you got issues you're, you're, you're trying to struggle with and you got some junk going on in your life. Listen to me. I know you want good counsel and sometimes we think good counsel is good and good counsel can help you, but nothing can help you like the abiding presence of Jesus. And just to get with him and just get on your face and say, Lord, gosh, I'm overwhelmed. I'm just out of bad, I'm so sorry that I haven't talked to you in a while. And but God, I'm here and I want to I be with you. The Bible says God closes the gap and he comes near. Jesus says, you know what you need? To remain in me. You're saying, man, I don't have productivity. I don't have success. I don't, have... don't chase after those things. Chase after Jesus. Jesus didn't say follow fruit bearing. Jesus didn't say follow the success path. Jesus didn't say follow the success guru. He said, follow me. Me, what do I need? I need Jesus. It's no accident that for many of us, we have words coming into our life from all over the place. It's coming in from the internet. We got words coming from Hollywood and we're listening to them. We're adjusting our lives to them. But God says, you need my words. You need my presence. That's what you need more than anything else. And it's a confusing world we live in. Don't get me wrong, man. I can leave here and I can watch, read a few articles and I can just say, I can't under, people are so confused and they're so confusing. But God is very clear. And God's saying, you know what? You need me. You need me. It occurred to me working on this particular point and spending some time in Scripture that some of us, we may be overwhelmed right now, but, but you may not be overwhelmed by what you're carrying. But what you may be overwhelmed by is how you're carrying it. And what if what, if what you're carrying, the fear, the difficulty, the struggle, what, what if what you're carrying, the guilt, whatever it is, what if the truth is God's saying, you're not designed to carry it anyway. You need me. You have to remain in me. The fruit of forgiveness, the fruit of a brand new beginning, the fruit of a changed attitude and heart, the fruit of a different way of thinking. And thinking. God says that comes with you staying near me. That's, that's where it'll come from. It won't come from you going, okay, that's it. I'm going to change. We're downsizing. And if we downsize, I won't worry about my bills. The truth is it doesn't matter how many bills you have. If you have an attitude of worry and you have fear in your spirit and you're not remaining in Jesus, no matter what you have, whether it's much or little, you'll continue to worry and you'll continue to be filled with fear. Jesus says, I'm the answer. Abide in me. That's what he's saying. Remain in me. Remain in me. The third thing that we see that I think is hugely important when it's time for us to overcome what's overwhelming us is we have to learn to love what will last. We're taught to love everything else. And we are as a community, as a country, as a church as people in love with temporary things. And we are selling our lives out to the temporary exercise of, of, of enjoyment. We're, we're selling ourselves out to the, the pursuit of a dollar. We're selling ourselves out to all of these experiences and all these temporary things. What we realize, don't realize is, is that we have to understand that there are some things that really, really matter. And that's what Jesus is going to get to and he's about to show us something really good. The truth is, is that this is not a message about God saying, hey, I want to reduce everything that overwhelms you. And incidentally, I think it's important for me to give you this disclaimer. When you choose to remain in Christ, when you choose to follow Jesus, that does not mean your life's going to get easier. It does not mean that your life is going to be less complicated or complex, because that's what we sell it as sometimes. As pastors, we sell you on this idea, oh gosh, everything will be so much simpler. You, you'll have so much more comfort. Everything, no. God is inconvenient as heck. What he's called you to be and do is inconvenient. And it doesn't mean because you're selling out to Jesus that you're not going to have obstacles and difficulties. You don't have to read but a few pages of the New Testament and realize that the guy that wrote the majority of the New Testament had some struggles. The Apostle Paul, this is the guy that God's number one missionary. Where does he wind up? In jail. Wait, I thought he would get a palace and a camel with 20-inch hubs on it. 
No, what'd he get? He got put in jail. The guy that we followed, Jesus, remember him? Yeah, what happened to him? Summer of his life, he lived, he struggled, and he died on the bald side of a hill. So I don't want you to get the false idea that when we sell it to Jesus, that you're going to have an easier life. You won't necessarily. There's going to be some hard complications and difficulties and decisions you're going to have to make. There's going to be friends that will walk out of your life. Here's the thing, though. What will you gain by choosing to follow Jesus? You'll gain this one reality, that whatever it is that you're living for now is worth it. It's worth it. See, God's not taking the top off of Everest and making it easier for you to climb it. But what he is saying is this, is it's worth getting to the top. It's worth climbing it. It's worth it. When when you make a decision, a choice, a moral choice, I'm not going to live that way. And you say, I'm not going to do that. I know everybody else is. I'm not going to do that. And then that person close to you says, well, you know what? If you're going to do that, if if you're drawing that kind of line, then I'm walking out. And you go, I'm going to follow Jesus. And they walk. It's worth it. It's worth it. The temporary moment of pleasure that you're going to get from the compromise in no way would cover what you're going to lose in eternity. But it's worth it. Listen to what Jesus says. In verse 9, John 15, he says, I've loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. That's, That's a beautiful statement. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love just as I've obeyed the Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you these things so that you'll be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way that I've loved you. There's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends, and if you do what I command, I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. Now you're my friends. Since I've told you everything, the Father has told me, you didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. This is my commandment. Love each other. Love each other. God's given us this opportunity to recognize and sell out to the things that really matter. And you know what? Many times we're overwhelmed because the stuff that we're really pursuing, it's really not worth it. It's not worth the agony that you're going through. It's not worth the trouble. It's really not. And what we need to do is submit to God's shears and say, Lord, does that need to be cut out? Does that need to go? Does that, does that thing need to hit the garden floor and me walk over it and, and move on? Maybe it does. And if it does, then do it. But remember this, is that all that we desire, the ultimate goal, God said, is, is he wants us, his end game, is he wants us to be like Jesus. You know what Jesus knew that you and I need to know? Is that God is enough. He's more than enough. And you and I need to know that. And by the way, until you get to the place that you recognize and know that Jesus is enough, nothing else ever will be, ever. And so we have a chance. We have to have a chance to, to let God adjust our lives, to move to where we need to be. And it's going to start by knowing that the pruning that's happening, you're getting your eggs scrambled in life, and you're like, man, this is getting all messed up. God has every right to do it. And you know what? When God does it, it's good. It's going to be for you. You may not understand it right now. It may not make any sense. It may seem chaotic to you at this particular moment, but God's at work and he's doing something in your life. Trust him. Trust him because he knows things you and I don't know. He knows forever. He knows all that now and we trust him and remain in Jesus. It's not about focusing on having joy. It's not focusing on being productive. It's about remaining in Jesus. The, The greatest practice you and I might have as a follower of Jesus, is to remain in him, to cling to him, to grow close to him, to spend time with him. Those conversations ongoing, his word constantly coming in. If we were to do that, I promise you it would change everything. And we have to learn how to love what's going to last. Are you in love with the temporary things? How many things are you sold out to that aren't really going matter to matter to anything in the next, you know, 100 years? What, what's, what's really going to matter? So I want to pray for you. And I want us to walk out of this place with a load lifted. I want us to walk out of this place more confident in God's word and more confident that our needs are fully met in Jesus. And so let me pray for you. Heads bowed and eyes closed. And I'll be looking around for just a second. Father, thank you, Lord, for the pruning that we all go through. God, thank you for constantly reminding us, Lord, that, that our life is, is as junk that's gathered and accumulated, Lord. May we have some spiritual yard sales and get rid of some stuff that's in the way. And in its place, replace it with things that matter, things that will last. God, help us to do that. Thank you, Lord, for spending time in your word and and giving it to us to teach us, Lord, how 
how important it is for us to be close to you. God, I know today may not be earth-shaking for us, but it's a reminder, God, may we practice it. Lord, in this room, I know that there's no doubt there's some people in this room right now, God, that don't know you. And Lord, maybe you've been misrepresented to them. And they don't know that you're a loving father. They don't know about your grace and they don't know about your compassion for them. What they've heard is a very judgmental and angry God. But Lord, I pray that they might know the care and compassion that you've demonstrated through the life that you lived on this earth, through the death that you died on the cross, and through the promises that you've made through your word. And Lord, I pray that they'll surrender themselves to you. For If there's anyone here, God, that, that don't know the peace and comfort that comes from knowing that their sins are forgiven and that their life has been redeemed in Jesus, Lord, I pray that they'll, I pray that they'll commit themselves to you right now, Lord. Maybe in just a simple prayer that they might speak to you silently right now and just, just something like this, just say, Lord, forgive me. God, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for loving me, Jesus. Come into my life, God. Give me strength and save me. I choose today to follow you. God, I pray that they might know that if they, from their heart, might speak to you in such a way, Lord, that you enter in their life and you take away their sin and you fill them with your Holy Spirit and you give them purpose and a a future. Father, I pray for that. Lord, thank you for the rest of us, God, who as we struggle through life, giving us such comfort that your word gives us, Lord. May we practice your presence more consistently. May we let your voice be dominant in our life. May we let the shears of your word cut away the stuff in our life that doesn't need to be there. Lord, we love you and we thank you for all things. And may we leave this place encouraged, Lord, knowing, God, that you have given us another chance, another opportunity. Father, we love you and thank you. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.